Have you ever heard of Murder Incorporated? The Brooklyn gang that committed hundreds of contract murders over the years. Anastasia was their patron and one of their main customers. Every mob boss has a lot of blood on his hands, otherwise there's no way to get to the top of this world. But Anastasia didn't just get his hands dirty with blood, he bathed in it. According to journalists' calculations, he had more than six dozen murders on his conscience, of which about a third were by his own hands. His manic behavior not only scared those from whom he tried to get something, but even his colleagues, other bosses of the Cosa Nostra. And the worst part? Anastasia was not stupid. He understood perfectly well how he could use his reputation to gain control of the Port of Brooklyn, part of the largest port in the United States. You can imagine the money that could be made there. So if you're interested in hearing the story of the most brutal mob boss in the United States, who earned such nicknames as Lord High Executioner and the Mad Hatter during his lifetime, then meet Albert Anastasia on the other side of the law. I want to ask you to take your mind off the video for a moment and look at the cool print I made for you. If you like it, you could buy any product you like by clicking the link in the description. And of course, every item you purchase contributes to the growth and advancement of the channel. Thank you for your attention. Now let's dive deeper into the story of our hero for today. Albert Anastasia, then called Umberto, was born in 1902 in a small fishing town called Topia in the Calabria region. It was difficult to call his family rich. With the total of 11 children, the family survived on just the salary of his father who worked on the railroad. The constant earthquakes that plagued the region at the time did not make their lives any easier. By the way, some believe that it was the tragedies associated with two particularly strong earthquakes, which occurred when Anastasia was not yet 10 years old, that served as the factor that broke Albert's psyche, making him an insensitive psychopath. The first happened when he was three years old. For that one, the inhabitants of Tropia, for the most part, managed to leave their homes so there were not so many dead victims. But the second, which happened three years later, turned the town into a place where you could make a movie about the post-apocalypse. It started at 5 a.m. when most people were asleep, causing a lot of casualties. Instruments at the time showed that it was as high as a 7 on the Richter scale, but modern scientists say it could have rated higher on the scale. Tropia was literally destroyed in this earthquake. Under the rubble, you could see the limbs of dead people, and those who survived resembled zombies. Covered with dust and blood, they could be seen digging through the garbage to find food or water. Gangs of looters appeared, who stole valuables right off the corpses. When caught by the police, they were shot on the spot, which did not add to the tranquility of the situation. And then the infection set in. Besides the rotting corpses, many of the living had festering wounds due to the lack of disinfectants. That only added to the death toll. It was like hell on earth, and six-year-old Albert Anastasia was in the midst of it. And I think that kind of environment really could have caused the psychological trauma that influenced him to form a very strange attitude towards life and death. Albert's family survived this tragedy and continued to live in Tropia, where at the age of 12, Anastasia would drop out of school and take a job as a sailor on the steamship Sardinia. Aboard this ship, he would arrive in New York City in 1917, disembark, and never return abroad. Initially, Albert got a job as a longshoreman, but very soon got together with one of the gangs operating in the port and retrained as a gangster, engaging in robbery, extortion, and beating people for money, in which he was very successful. Here he met a guy named Giuseppe Florino, who became his main partner in illegal affairs throughout the Roaring Twenties. And it was with him that Albert committed his first murder, for which he almost went to the electric chair at the age of 18. It's worth reviewing his first known murder. In 1921, they were arrested for the murder of Joseph Torella. Supposedly, Anastasia and Florino had been hired for the assassination by a group of Sicilian counterfeiters who had been in conflict with Torella. Initially, they were sentenced to death, but on appeal, the defense lawyer managed to prove that the main witness who saw them at the time of the assassination attempt had his own motivations to point out Florino and Anastasia. As it turns out, this woman believed that her husband, who had been sentenced to prison for theft, was innocent and was behind bars because Florino and Anastasia had framed him. The court considered this a serious motive to commit perjury, which caused the case to fall apart and the killers to go free. Apparently, they learned no lessons at all, for they were arrested again almost immediately. 
They were suspected of murdering Carmelo Ferraro, a local gangster. The authorities failed to prove anything, and the two were released after three days. In that same year, 1922, that Albert avoided jail twice, he went to work as a bodyguard to bootlegger Giordano Biagio, who was in a showdown with the gang of Salvador de Aquila, then the boss of all the bosses of the Italian Mafia. It started with the murders of Biagio's partner, Gregorio Lagagna, and then Biagio's bodyguard, Annabelle Stillo. The strikes were carried out by the Busardo brothers, an assassination attempt on one of whom was organized by Anastasia and Florino. And the showdown ended with the murder of Biagio himself, because Albert could not retaliate since he and his accomplice were almost immediately sentenced to three years for illegally carrying weapons. Released in 1925, Anastasia seems to have taken over the port of Brooklyn. The means by which Albert managed to gain control of the port is not detailed anywhere. Usually authors just point us to the fact that he was able to run things on the waterfront through the local labor unions. I discussed how this works in more detail in the video about Louis Buckhalter. If you're interested in extortion through union capture, watch that one too. The only thing I found was his involvement in the murder of Carmine Sanatiempo in 1926, who was then called the king of the Brooklyn waterfront. This seems to have been the process by which Anastasia took control of the harbor. It was around this time that Albert fell in with D'Aquila's faction, whose men he had previously fought. After D'Aquila was killed in the war with Joe Masseria, Anastasia ended up in the Manillo family. If you don't know who I am talking about, watch my video about the birth of the American Mafia. There I discuss the details, the conflicts by which the Cosa Nostra was born. But let's continue. Manillo sided with Masseria in the Castellamariz War, which means that Anastasia did as well. The Castamarese War, if you don't know, was a conflict that resulted in the formation of the modern American Mafia system with a democratic body called the Commission, made up of the heads of the most powerful families in the world. There were two factions at war. One was led by Maranzano and the other by Masseria. Maranzano would win the war but would eventually be killed. Anastasia had been credited with participating in assassination attempts on both Masseria and Maranzano, but it's impossible to know for sure. After the end of the war, Albert would get a position as deputy boss in the family of Vincent Mangiano, with whom he would later have a serious conflict. In just over 10 years, Anastasia had gone from a longshoreman to the head of the port and the second man in an influential mafia family. And all along the way, a trail of blood followed him. At least 11 murders were committed by Albert during this period. However, the real massacre still lies ahead, because very soon, the gang called Murder Incorporated would begin its work for which Anastasia would not only be a patron, but also a regular customer. I had already touched on the topic of the Murder Incorporated gang in the video about Louis Buckhalter, who was one of their patrons. The second, however, was Anastasia. But before I begin to tell their story, I'll repeat for new viewers what I had said in the Buckhalter video. Murder Incorporated. Of course, such an audacious name for this Brooklyn gang controlled by Buchalter and Anastasia was invented by journalists. And then on the basis of this name, there were so many rumors that the order of the assassins from the game of the same name can nervously smoke in the side. For example, there are rumors that new killers in the gang invariably received orders to kill an experienced murderer who had already managed to perform several hits, and thus the management eliminated a lot of knowledgeable people. The new hitman would subsequently be eliminated in the same manner. According to other rumors, these new killers all came out of local teenage gangs and typically barely approached 18 years of age. Those who did the best jobs were not killed, but were relegated to the category of so-called professionals, retained on a fixed salary to carry out especially important orders. And who paid them? Right, the criminal syndicate headed by Luciano, whose private army they were. The gang's numbers varied from 500 to 1,500 people. The total number of murders they committed came to less than a thousand. Sounds like a great story for a cool action movie where the investigator catches the most dangerous gang in the world. However, the reality, as always, was much more prosaic. They were not on the payroll of a crime syndicate because there was no crime syndicate. Those who have been watching me for a long time already know why. For those who haven't, check out my video on the birth of the American Mafia. Actually, as with most everything else, the truth has been greatly exaggerated. It was an ordinary gang which, just like others, engaged in extortion, usury, prostitution, and other illegal activities. And as a secondary business, they started fulfilling orders by Buckhalter, Anastasia, and others who had contracts with them. 
Another thing is that they didn't kill on the level of modern drug cartels, and they were never a private army. They were a gang of common thugs who eliminated dozens, maybe hundreds, but by no means thousands of people. The Murder Incorporated, which I will hereafter refer to simply as the Corporation, was an amalgamation of two Brooklyn gangs. The Ocean Hill Boys, led by Happy Mayoni, and the Brownsville Boys, led by Abe Rellis. Anastasia initially made contact with them because they operated in Brooklyn, the neighborhood where Albert was based. He met them in the late 1920s through Louis Capone, whose restaurant Rellis frequented. Anastasia one day offered to do a little dirty work for a financial reward. Gangsters agreed and did a great job, and then began to receive new orders from Anastasia at various times. And in the early 1930s, Louis Buckhalter was sent to them by Anastasia and he became another regular customer. And then came what journalists have dubbed Murder Incorporated. And I could go on for a long time to try to explain in various epitaphs what the cooperation between Anastasia and the corporation was, how terrible it was, how it was a terrible mixture where one psychopath gave orders to others and those without the slightest shame fulfilled them. But I believe that this would not fully demonstrate the inhumanity of this group. Instead, I suggest that you simply listen to the enumeration of a certain number of murders they committed. It seems to me that dry facts here will perform better than vivid epithets. 1933, John Frischia, small-time racketeer, crossed Joe Adonis, who worked for Anastasia, was strangled in a car and thrown into the street. 1935, Hyman Cantor, small-time drug dealer, had a problem with Anastasia, found 20 days after he had disappeared in a bay off the Bahamas. The top of his skull looked like mush. 1935 again, brothers Joe and Louis Amberg. It was a gang war. The Ambergs had somehow crossed Albert, thinking that the patronage of Lansky and Adonis would save them from reprisal. Anastasia managed to convince their patrons to authorize the assassination, after which Joe was killed first, along with his driver. The killers caught them in the garage, put them against the wall, and literally riddled them. A month later, Lewis was also killed. 1937, Frank Keenan. He killed one of Anastasia's men. Albert personally participated in the vendetta and pulled the trigger. Keenan's body was found in a gutter. 1939, Antonio Cicillano and Cesare Lataro. They refused to carry out Anastasia's orders to kill a man interfering with extortion through labor unions. They were found murdered in their own beds. In addition, an unwanted witness, Felice Esposito, was also killed. 1939, Maurice Diamond. Murder again linked to extortion through labor unions. This time, Anastasia sent his men to shoot Diamond at the request of Louis Buchhalter. 1939 again, Irving Feinstein. The assassination was ordered at the request of Vincent Mangiano, as Irving was doing clandestine loan sharking in his territory and refused to pay protection fees. Feinstein's skull was fractured, then he was tied up, and when he was found to still be alive, they finished the job by strangulation. Same year, 1939, the most famous racketeering murder on the Brooklyn waterfront. Peter Panto was an activist who, in spite of intimidation, was active in opposing the power of the gangsters in the harbor. He fought for decent wages for port workers and an end to extortion by the mafia and its presence in the unions. Panto was kidnapped and later strangled by the bare hands of a murder incorporated operative. All the murders I listed above had logical explanations. I mean, it's the world of crime, power struggles, and all that. However, if they had all been like that, then Anastasia wouldn't have been nicknamed the Mad Hatter. I even had an example where Albert ordered a man killed simply because he didn't like him. He never even knew or saw him personally, but that didn't stop Anastasia from taking his life. We're talking about Arnold Schuster, who turned in the elusive bank robber Willie Sutton to the police. As legend has it, Anastasia saw Schuster on TV and with the words, I hate snitches, went to dial the phone number of one of his men. Schuster was eventually shot and killed on Anastasia's orders. As a sign of contempt, Albert also ordered that he be shot in the eyes and groin. As you can see, taking a man's life was about as easy for Anastasia as drinking water or smoking a cigarette. And the above cases are only what has come to light. In total, as the journalists calculated, Albert could have been involved in more than 60 deaths. Most of them occurred, of course, during the peak of Murder, Inc.'s activity. However, the gang was dismantled by the authorities in the early 1940s, resulting in many, including Louis Buchhalter, being sentenced to death. One of the few who managed to avoid this fate was Anastasia. It started with the arrest of Abe Rellis, who agreed to testify against his former associates and patrons, resulting in the arrest of most of the gang members. Some of them also agreed to cooperate, while others ended their lives in the electric chair. 
Anastasia was also wanted in connection with Rellis' testimony, but the authorities were unable to find him. Albert only turned up after Rellis had somehow fallen out of the window of the hotel where he was being held and died of his injuries. There were rumors that Frank Costello, the boss of another mafia family and friend of Anastasia, had managed to bribe the guards through his connections and arrange Rellis' fall. Whether this was the case or not is not known. However, Anastasia avoided punishment in the case of Murder, Inc. because the prosecution was based on the testimony of Rellis. Of course, the loss of a whole gang of assassins reduced the number of people Albert could send to the other world, but this event did not change him at all. He remained the same ruthless killer whose main slogan was, either him or you, and very soon he would have to apply this motto in a very dangerous situation. Shortly after Albert escaped the death penalty for the second time in his life, the United States entered World War II. Anastasia similarly joined the troops. He did not participate in combat, but spent the entire war on the home front. Nevertheless, even this allowed him to finally obtain American citizenship. When the war ended, Albert returned to New York, where he was still the second man in the family of Vincent Mangano, with whom Albert's relations year by year became worse and worse. And by the early 1950s, they had deteriorated to such an extent that there was about to be a storm and a high-profile murder in the Mafia. And it was a very turbulent time in the Cosa Nostra. A network of conspiracies and coalitions turned the American Mafia into a tangle of snakes, where everyone was ready to strike his neighbor. By the early 1950s, there were three factions in New York. One, the so-called conservative faction, consisted of the bosses who had been on the first commission. It included Bonanno, Profasi, and Mangiano. The second faction included Anastasia and Costello. The third was Lucisi and Genovesi. It was Anastasia's actions that started the whole mess. His boss, Vincent Mangiano, did not like the fact that Albert behaved too independently. He was also annoyed by Anastasia's close relationship with another family's boss, Frank Costello. For example, when Costello was briefly imprisoned in 1950, he directly asked Albert to look after his business interests, fearing that Vito Genovese, who had returned from Italy, might stage a coup in the family. Mangiano was very unhappy that his subordinate was being handled in a way that had bypassed him. Vincent began to fear that Albert, backed by Costello, might run a coup to take over as boss. Therefore, Mangiano began preparing a preemptive strike to take out Anastasia before Anastasia could strike. However, Mangiano was too late. Albert eliminated Vincent and his brother Philip in the spring of 1951. Everyone around him guessed that he was responsible for the disappearance of the Mangiano brothers, but no one could prove anything. The next case in this Mafia Game of Thrones was Vito Genovese. In the early 1930s, he was higher in the family hierarchy than Costello, but due to legal problems, Vito had to flee to Italy. When he returned to the States after World War II, he was not happy to have Frank become the head of the family. He had wanted to get the position for himself and had long hatched a plan to make it happen. On this basis, Genovese got together with Lucchesi because Tommy wanted to move Anastasia to put Carlo Gambino in his place. They were going to take out Albert first because he was the main force in the pairing with Costello. But this was discovered by Costello, who brought it to the commission. Lucchesi then managed to justify himself and postponed the murder of Anastasia. This is when Genovese decided that he either had to act immediately, or Costello, who guessed that Vito was also involved in the plot to kill Anastasia, would eliminate him first. Genovese struck in 1955. A gunman named Vincent Gigante spied Frank in an entryway and shot him in the head. The bullet only lightly grazed his skull and Costello survived, but he refused to fight and voluntarily resigned as boss after being guaranteed immunity by Genovese. Anastasia was now left alone against two. Immediately after the assassination attempt, Albert planned to wage war against Genovese. This did not happen only because of the two other bosses, Profasi and Bonanno, managed to dissuade him. They told him that if he decided to go on the attack, they could not stay out of it and would try to put a damper on the conflict. But if he left things as they were, then in the event of an attack on Anastasia himself, Profasi and Bonanno would take his side in the war. A dinner followed at which Anastasia and Genovese met face to face, voicing their mutual grievances and seemed even able to negotiate a peaceful settlement. But all this was just a sham and smokescreen. Soon Albert would receive a blow for which he did not seem to be at all prepared. By the way, an interesting fact for lovers of mysticism, shortly before his death, Anastasia was seen in the company of a girl named Janice Drake. This lady liked to sleep with various criminal personalities. But what was special about her? Many men soon passed away violently after dating her. Albert was no exception. 
In October 1957, Anastasia walked into a barbershop by himself and left with his legs on a stretcher. Four gunmen burst into the barbershop as Albert sat with hot towels on his face and shot him with pistols. This was the story of Albert Anastasia, who spent his life as a ruthless thug and ended it as an exhibit for journalists with cameras who came by the dozens to the scene of his murder. Yes, it is very symbolic that the most famous photo of the criminal leader who went down in history as the bloodiest mafia boss ever was in this photo. It was as if life itself has thus demonstrated to us the inevitability of punishment.